Luke 6, 12 says, Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. This is speaking of Jesus, and the context is, is that he chose 12 of his disciples. He had many disciples. We don't know how many disciples Jesus had. But there were 12 of them whom he named apostles. And Luke tells us that the night before he chose the 12 that would be named apostles, he spent the entire night in prayer to God. I have never prayed all night long. I've never done that. But think about it. Jesus is the Son of God, God the Son, the one in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, the perfect God-man. And prayer is an expression of dependence. And if Jesus had something important to do, and it was important enough that he devote an entire night to prayer... If Jesus needed to prioritize prayer in that manner, then what does that say about you finish the sentence? This year we've been talking about the year of prayer. We've been looking in Luke and in Acts, and in that we've been examining the special emphasis that Luke has on prayer so that we can learn about prayer and be encouraged to pray. One of the things I think that we've discovered and we'll rediscover today as we kind of tie this all together is that today we're summarizing the year of prayer and then we're going to have an epilogue, a footnote, if you will, for Advent because we're going to talk about from Luke instances where God spoke to his people about his work. So really the flip side of talking to God is God talking to us. And we're going to talk about that during Advent out of Luke regarding the birth of Jesus. But having said that, as we've gone through the year of prayer, then it's been something that has been foundational, meaningful, but it really doesn't have a wow factor, does it? I mean, when you talk about prayer as a Christian, and you talk about developing a consistent prayer life, to be the kind of person that prays all night long, and you consider that, what's the typical response from the typical churchgoer? Oh, man, that's great. You know, prayer's great. We need prayer. Yeah, everybody needs to pray. I would submit to you that in this year that... I have discovered transforming truths from God's Word. Discovered may be too strong of a word. It may be rediscovered or reinforced. But there are things that God has shown me and reminded me as we have emphasized prayer in Luke and Acts this year that have motivated me to pray. That have inspired me to pray. And therefore, they are transforming truths about prayer. And I don't know what yours are, but my prayer is that God has done something to motivate and inspire you. And in light of that, today, I'm going to share two transforming truths that I've discovered from God's Word in, in this year that have really re-energized my desire to pray and made me want to pray. So rather than give you those truths and then talk about them in a deductive sort of way, I'm going to approach it more inductively. We're going to look at the scriptures that represent those truths and then discover what they are. And I want this to be sort of, a, of an exclamation point on the year of prayer. So let's look at the first, and let's look at some representative passages because there are many more that we could use. First, let's go to Luke 10, 2. Let's go to Luke 10, 2. These scriptures, by the way, aren't listed in the back of your bulletin. You feel free to write them down if you'd like to refer to them later. But they will be, there will be, all of them will be on the screen in front of you. Read with me. Then he said to them, 
The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. <coughs> Pastor Keith preached on this passage just a few weeks ago. It's a passage that betrays the fact that Jesus' primary strategy for reaching the whole world with the message about him was not an aggressive strategy to send people out and organize people. It all began with prayer. Prayer was the foundation of Jesus' strategy for recruitment and deployment of witnesses about him into the world. Prayer was the first thing, the springboard to everything else God wanted him to do on this earth and us to do. I would submit to you that that's significant because that's not typically the case for us. We typically try everything we can do and exhaust our efforts, and then when we're desperate and realize we can't get it done, what do we do? As a lifeline, we call out in God to prayer. It's like me and George Fisher. I see George there. George, I was talking about you in the early service. I remind, this reminds me of, of us. Some of you have heard the story. About two or three years ago, George called me up one day and he said, Hey, I've got an extra ticket to the Bay Hill Golf Tournament. Would you like to go down and watch the tournament with me? Hey, yeah, I'd love to go. I don't have anything on my calendar that day that would conflict. I'd love to do that. So, George, we went down to the golf tournament. And if you've ever done that, you park in the garages at Universal, like the parking garages, and then they bus you over to the golf course. So we parked in the parking garage at Universal. Let me give you a clue. Let me give you a tip about doing that if you, if you haven't learned this. Be sure to make a note of the section where you're parked. Be sure to note that. That's a smart thing to do. We went to the tournament. We watched. We walked around about 3 o'clock. George said, you know, I've, I'm kind of, I'm about ready. Hey, George, fine. Let's go. So we get back on the bus about 3 o'clock. We ride back over to the parking garage. At 5.30, we are still looking for his car. At that point, I'm in panic mode. I was even afraid I was going to lose George because we'd split up to find the car. This, I'm, I mean, it was like there's... So I finally, we ran into each other. I said, George, we got to pray. I mean, I don't know what else. We got to pray. So we prayed, Lord, you know where this car is. You know everything. You know where this car is. Please lead us to it. So then George goes off, and I turn as soon as he goes off, and I walk down an aisle, and here comes a guy in a golf cart that works there, one of the attendants that works there. And I'm flagging him down, and I say, listen, man, we, we can't find our car. And, and I'm desperate here. And he said, well, what time did you get here? We knew the approximate time. He had a chart, you know, of where they were parking cars at what time of day. And he tells me, he says, well, it's probably in section whatever. You know, go find, you go down a couple floors and go over here, and it'll be in, you know. So... That was just minutes after we prayed. So then I go down, and I go to that section, and George is down there honking the horn. He had found the car, and, I, and, and George is there, the car's there. And it's like within 15 minutes after we prayed, we found the car. But it took us two hours to get to pray about it. But that's the way we are in life. We pretty much exhaust our options and then, oh, by the way, maybe we ought to pray. Jesus is saying you pray first if you want to do it God's way. And then in Luke 22, in verse 40 and 46, it's the night Jesus was betrayed. After his disciples had a meal with him, he went out to the Garden of Gethsemane. It says, when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And then he says, a little bit later, he says, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. So what we see from Jesus here is that his strategy for resisting temptation, as we saw, as we looked at the model prayer, the Lord's Prayer, just a couple weeks ago, that Jesus' strategy for being able to resist temptation and sin is to pray. If our prayer life is what it needs to be and what it should be, then we'll have the ability to say no to sin and yes to God. And the reason we'd struggle otherwise is because we get those out of order. 
And we don't prioritize prayer. That's Jesus' strategy. What I would submit these examples as confirming, and there are many others we could use, but the first transforming truth is that prayer was foundational in Jesus' life. Likewise, he taught that if we want to live a life that pleases God, it must be in ours also. And there are no, there's no option two. There's no option two. If we're really serious about God, and we're really serious about what He wants for our life, if prayer is not plan A, then we're never going to fulfill our desires. We're never going to see God work in our life the way that He wants to work or that we claim to want Him to work. If prayer is an add-on for you, then you're never going to realize God's best for your life. Now, a second transforming truth. Now, let me preface these scriptures. We're going to look at several different scriptures. So hang with me. But let me preface them by saying, listen to this. Without the supernatural, there is no Christianity. Now, what, I, what I'm getting at, what we've done, we have, we have dumbed down the Christian faith in the evangelical world in America, by and large, to an intellectual academic exercise. Well, I'm going to tell you something. If there aren't miracles, and if God doesn't show up, you have no Christianity. Every foundational truth or event about the Christian faith was confirmed by a supernatural invasion, manifestation of God's power on this earth in people's lives. Start with the resurrection. Pretty supernatural, don't you think? With that having been said, Let's look at some representative passages in Luke and Acts and then come to a conclusion about prayer. So, first transformational principle, if prayer mattered to Jesus, it better matter to us. Jesus was preeminently, we know him about his miracles, his preaching, his teaching. I'm telling you, a close reading of Scripture will prove that Jesus, more than anything, was a man of prayer. More than anything. Secondly, let's go to Luke 1 and following. We'll do these in order. Be easy to find. Easy to list. Luke 1, 10, Zacharias is in the temple serving his priestly duties before the birth of John the Baptist, his son, and he gets an angelic visitation announcing the fact that his wife will become pregnant. And the Bible says in Luke 1, 10, and the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. Notice there was prayer happening. People were in the midst of prayer while he was in there serving. And that's when God sent his angel to speak to him. It was as they prayed in the middle of the prayer meeting. Secondly, Luke 3, 21, Jesus is baptized. Jesus is baptized. And it says, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized by John the Baptist. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened. And if you hear, know the rest of the story, when Jesus was baptized, heaven was opened. There was a sound from heaven. God the Father spoke, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And there was a visible manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove that came down and rested on Jesus. That was a supernatural manifestation of God's presence that was discernible by the senses by the natural senses. And it happened while Jesus was praying. He was praying while he was baptized. As he prayed. I'll tell a story. I wouldn't tell it if they were here because it would embarrass them. And I'm not going to name any names so you don't know which one. But when one of my daughters was married and I officiated at the wedding, I was standing there at the front of the church and 
they were standing in front of me and we got to the point in the wedding, you know, after the vows had been exchanged and the rings had been exchanged and there's a, there was a song, you know, like a solo, a song. And so I'm standing there and my son-in-law is leaning over talking in the ear of my daughter while the song's going on. So I get up closer. I'm wondering what they're talking about. <laughs> so I, I moved in. I moved in. He was praying in her ear. I'm going to tell you what, you want to get on a daddy-in-law's good side? <laughs> you want to impress your father-in-law? <laughs> That's the way to do it. But that's the concept. We pray as we go. And that's what turns it into a supernatural event. As Jesus was baptized. And then the transfiguration. In Luke 9, you remember, Jesus was there with the disciples on the mountain, and there was a, 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 an in, in invasion of heaven. The, Moses and Elijah, now Moses had lived how long before Jesus? Bible trivia, 1,500 years, give or take. Long time, right? And Elijah had lived how long before Jesus? 800 years, give or take. And there they both are with Jesus talking with him on the mountain. And listen to what the Bible says. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white. He's listening. It was as he was praying that the power of God was manifested. The presence of God was revealed. And then in Acts... After the ascension of Jesus back to heaven, the Bible says in Acts chapter 1 and 2, it says in Acts 1, these all continued, talking about the early church, the early believers there. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. They all continued in prayer. And the Bible says 10 days later, Acts 2, 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. That was a 10-day prayer meeting. Many people have rightly pointed out the church was not born in a business meeting. The church was not born in a revival service. The church was not born in a preaching crusade or a preaching event. The church was not born in a, in a musical concert. The church was born in a prayer meeting. That's when the power of God fell. And the Holy Spirit came, and God fulfilled His promises in Scripture. And then in Acts 3, we find Peter and John. In Acts 3, now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And then it goes on to talk about how there was a man there lame, and they healed him. And his bones were straightened, and he got up and walked, and it was a great opportunity for preaching. Many people heard about Jesus that day as they went to the temple to pray. So it was as they were intending and moving to prayer that God's power moved. And then Acts 4. Acts 4, after they had gotten in trouble for following Jesus, they'd been threatened by the authorities. The same people that had murdered Jesus threatened them. And they got together to pray in response to that. And they said, oh, Lord, get us out of here. We're afraid. No, they said, Lord, just be, take note of their threats. Give us boldness. <laughs> and it says, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the Word of God with boldness. Notice it was when they had prayed, so it wasn't actually in the middle of the prayer, but it was as soon as the amen hit, then the place shook. That's close enough to being in prayer for me. And then Stephen, who was stoned to death, the deacon of the church that was killed by the Jewish rulers for his stand for Jesus, and it says, and they stoned Stephen in Luke, or pardon me, in Acts 7. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, 
voice, Lord, do not charge him with his sin. And when he said this, he fell asleep. In the midst of being murdered, stoned to death. I can't imagine how horrendous that would be to have rocks hitting you in the head with rocks to kill you. Talk about painful. In the midst of that, he was in prayer. The Bible says he saw heaven open, Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And then in Acts 9, Paul, also known as Saul, his Hebrew name, he made, a, he made it his purpose in life to destroy Christians and kill them, right? You remember that? And he was on his way from Jerusalem to Damascus in Syria to find more followers of the way, other Jewish people who were followers of Jesus as the Messiah. Well, the Lord had a surprise for him because on the way to Damascus, Jesus appeared to him. And he appeared in his unbridled glory, and it blinded Paul. It blinded him in the radiance of his glory. And, and he said, why are you persecuting me? And he said, well, who are you? He said, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. And by the way, isn't that say volumes about Jesus' identity with his people? Because it was his followers that he was persecuting. Jesus identifies with his people. He says, you're persecuting me. And, and, and then he tells him to go to Damascus... And, and to find a man named Ananias. And there's communication between the Lord and Saul, the Lord and Ananias. And look at this. The Lord says to Ananias in Acts 9, 11, The Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street, call straight, and inquire at the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. Notice that... Paul went into a three-day prayer meeting after he met Jesus on the road. And it was in the midst of that that he was, his sight was restored. He was baptized. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. It was as he prayed that Paul's ministry was launched. It was in the midst of prayer and as Ananias heard from God. And then in Acts 10, Peter is down at Joppa on the... Uh, on the coast of Israel. And Peter is at the home uh, of Simon the Tanner. And it says, as the next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Notice Peter is up on the roof of this guy's house praying. And that's when God gave him a vision and showed him that Gentiles could actually get in on this too. You didn't have to be just Jewish to follow Jesus. God gave him this amazing vision and he, and, and he was able to go then to Cornelius, the Roman centurion, uh, the first time a purely Gentile, you know, uh, Ethiopian eunuch was a God-fearer, proselyte, and then you, you had uh, the Samaritans who were related. This is the first... Uh, total Gentile that came to faith in Jesus and the whole thing was inaugurated because Peter was in prayer you see when he was in prayer he was in a place where God could use him sometimes we wonder why doesn't God use us more well maybe and then this one I love in Acts 12 this is a is a hilarious story Peter is arrested and put in prison because of his stand and his relationship with Jesus, right? So it says in verse 5, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Constant prayer. The church was unceasing in their prayer for Peter to be released from jail. So God sends the angels to open the doors of jail, lead Peter right out, takes him right over there to the house where the church is praying. And if you've never read this before in Acts 12, you need to read it. it, it it's hilarious because what they do, they come out, they say, well, you know, uh, Peter's at the door. No, hush, Peter's in jail. You're interrupting our prayer. No, he's at the door. God is answered. Before you finish praying, God is answered. Miraculously, supernaturally, let him out of jail. And then, Acts 13, the first missionaries were sent out, Paul and Silas. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Paul for the work which I've called them. It doesn't say they were praying. It says they ministered to the Lord and fasted. I would submit to you that that's a synonym for prayer. 
You cannot minister to the Lord and fast together without praying at some point of time. And that's when God spoke and sent them out. And you know what? We're the result here today. We are the result of both what God told Peter on the rooftop while he prayed and what God told Paul and the church in Antioch while they prayed. We are the result if we're Gentile. There's some of us here that are Jewish that are believers today, but most of us are Gentile, and we would be lost if it were not for him and for their prayers. And then this one that I love. Paul went to Philippi. He and his companion Silas were put in jail in the city of Philippi for their stand for Christ. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. As they prayed and sang hymns, the entire foundation of the jail was shaken. It was an earthquake, and the bars flew open to the jail. And as a result, everybody's attention was riveted on Paul and Silas, and they came to a desire to know the God that Paul and Silas were worshiping because the power of God was released. But Paul and Silas weren't praying for God to shake the jailhouse. Paul and Silas were praying because they loved God and they honored him, and God moved through that as a result of that. His power was released miraculously as they prayed. Second transforming truth. The supernatural, miracle-working power of God was manifested as they prayed. As they prayed. And I want to tell you that transforms my whole attitude toward prayer. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the Bible says... Pray without ceasing. Could it be that the lack of the power of God that's manifested on a regular basis in our life is because we don't constantly put ourselves in a position to be used by God because we're not in prayer? You say, well, you know, I have such a hard time praying. Well, join the club and understand that God even gives a promise for that. Romans 8, 26, we don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit intercedes with us for, for us with groans and utterances beyond comprehension. The point is that God is there to help us pray. Many times my prayer has been, Lord, I don't know what to pray or how to pray. Help me. Have you ever thought about why it's so hard to pray? I mean, let's, let's have a show of hands. How many people struggle with their prayer life? I mean, how many people, those who were hands were down, how many people lie? <laughs> how many of us struggle? I do. Have you ever thought about why that might be? Did you ever think about that? Because that's where the power really lies. And maybe we've got somebody out there trying to keep us from praying. Did you ever think about that? The reason we get bored and we get excited about everything else that's so hard to get motivated is the enemy knows he's wicked, but he's not stupid. And puts impediments in our way. May God give us the spirit of Jesus in an attitude of prayer in Deltona Alliance Church. Well, how much did prayer mean to Jesus? Luke 23, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Where, what, what do you, who was he talking to there? God the Father, right? What do you call that? Prayer? Where was he when he prayed that? You recognize that? He was on the cross. Hmm. Luke 23, 46. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. 
Having said this, he breathed his last. Where was Jesus when he said that? Hmm. Let's see. Jesus prayed from the cross. His life was saturated by prayer. What does that teach us about what prayer meant to Jesus? What does prayer mean to you? I'm going to share a final, a final thought, a challenge. You know, I've been in ministry for a number of years. One of the things that's a phenomenon in the American church scene uh, since the late 70s when Donald McGavern published Understanding Church Growth is that everything about church life has all been about church growth, getting more people, more people, everything. And I will tell you as a fact, and anybody here that's a, maybe a pastor or a retired pastor, you, you can identify with this. I, I know you will. Is that everything, everything has been pressure to try to, you know, if, if, if your church doesn't have more people coming, you're doing something wrong. And let's go to this seminar, and they've got this, they've got this strategy. You're going to do this, and your church is going to grow. Man, and they change every two or three years. The tra your tra what happens, somebody does something, and a lot of people come, and, they f and, 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 and what they do, they package it. And, and, and it changes every two years. I remember back in the 80s, it was a phone for you, phone tree. I went to a thing, and they said, you got to get this phone thing. It's going to call everybody in town. Everybody's going to come. You know, and I'd go, and I'd, do, I'd go to all these seminars, and, I'd go, and I'd, it never worked. I'd come back and do it, and it never worked. And you know what? It didn't work for most pastors. And you know, and, and what's that do for your self-image? You know, most are going, well, what's wrong with me? If it's working for everybody else, what's wrong with me? Right? I'll never forget, back in the early 80s, I walked in a Christian bookstore, and I was talking to a fellow that worked there. We were talking. He said, you know, little church down the road, said the pastor there, he just, he just decided that he was going to really devote critical time every day just to be alone with God. And he said, I happen to know this guy, and I know that every day he's been faithful just to spend time with God. And he said, you know, for months, months, and months now, he's just been every day just sitting before the Lord and going to Him. And he said, you know something I've noticed? All of a sudden, his church is growing. He didn't, he's not doing anything any different. His, pre his preaching hasn't changed. You know what? I resonated with that because all of a sudden I figured, that sounds biblical to me, that this thing depends on God, not us. Amen? That sounds biblical. I can get my arms around that. And let me tell you this. Let me tell you something. I believe, and my heart is for us at Deltona Alliance Church, in our homes, in our businesses, not just at the church, but throughout our life, that we be saturated for, with prayer, that we are intercessors so that we are transforming this world through prayer. You know, I want God to bless Deltona Alliance Church. And I want him to impact our community. Not to grow a big church, but to transform a community. If it meant that this town was going to come to Jesus and this church burns down, let's light it up today. It's not about us. It's about him. It's about his glory. It's about his kingdom. And I don't want Deltona Alliance Church. Well, boy, they got a great preacher down there. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Oh, or man, they like band of music. They can knock it out and go. Or, whoa, they got, man, a beautiful building. They better go. No, none of that. None of that. Only one explanation. One explanation. Jesus is alive. And those people believe it and act like it. <laughs> one explanation. And the last thing I'll share, and then I'm going to hush. And I, I wanted to wait till January, but I can't hold myself. And, and it relates to this issue of prayer and our role and how I believe that God wants us to pray to transform a culture. It's not about growing a church. It's about transforming a culture through the presence of Jesus Christ in our community. 
You know, this year's been a year of prayer. We've emphasized a year of prayer. A few months ago, I got to thinking, you know, where, where, Lord, where do you want us to go? Where should we go next year? And, you know, I got a resonance in my heart in just one of those aha moments that I just sensed the Spirit of God confirming in my heart several weeks ago. Next year is going to be the year of the family in Deltona Alliance Church. Now, why? Let me tell you why. Because I believe there's a theological reason. I'll get to this. It's another sermon. But I believe that the foundation of God's agenda depends upon a foundation of the family. And the Bible says if the families are, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And I believe that we are seeing in the church and in our world the dismantlement of that foundational building block that God has put in place. He made a husband and wife before he made anything. Now, that being said, I came to that resonance in my heart. That's where we're going next year. All right, now, having said that, a couple weeks after I did that, Pastor Keith came in one day and he said, man, I just ran across an article. I was looking on the internet. I think it was in the Huffington Post, amazingly. I, 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 it, it was an article. And here's the title of the article. Here's the subset of the title of the article. I, I wish I could, I'm sorry. It's the best places for marriages to die. And it had a chart of the top 10 communities in the United States, top 10, for divorce. Deltona, Florida is number six in the United States. Four of the six are in Florida. Let me tell you something. We're going to do something about that. We're not going down without a fight. We're going to do something about that. We're going to get on God's page. And it starts and finishes on our knees with Him. Are you with me?